Welcome back to the Eduverse Enigma podcast. For the first time in person, this week we're chatting with special guest Mohi Sanazel, the program's manager at the DMZ. This episode, we'll be diving into entrepreneurship and the startup journey, accessibility to education around the world, and how AI technology is changing the game. You won't want to miss it. All right. All right. All right. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Eduverse Enigma podcast. Very excited today. This is our first in-person podcast, and we have Mohi on here. Mohi Sansel? Am I yeah, saying that right? Sanizel. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, we've had a lot of amazing conversations, so I'm excited to have you on this podcast because most of what we've talked about is kind of expert PR in the startup realm, and we'll get into why we've been talking about that. But I'm really excited just to learn more about you and your experience in, in the technology and education space. Um, so if we could start off, if you could just give a quick introduction of who you are. I mean, I would say that uh, we talk about everything matters, so expert PR is the only thing matters. <laughs> of course so yeah my name is Mohi and I'm from Iran originally I'm 34 33 I don't know uh, years old and I've been active in the technology space I would say you know since I was a child my father used to be a developer my brothers my uncle so you know being a developer coding used to be a family job to us so yeah I start like you know my ancestors I would say my father my you know parents and being a technical guy, I would say, interested in all the, you know, opportunities that computers can bring on. I remember the first, you know, my early days working with computer, I had no idea what computers can do. So I was like, okay, if we pour iron in a computer, you know, it can build a robot for us. So it was my imagination about computer. And what, what age was that at? I would say like uh, six five or six okay. so um 1990 january 1990 was 1995 something like that mm -hmm. and yeah i mean we have our first computer when i was seven so i started you know instead of working you know playing games or this kind of stuff i start you know developing coding i mean that that time it was just programming not right, developing. Right. and i grew up and i work in different you know positions mostly technical positions and then I launched my own business at the age of 21st, uh, 21, and it, it grew. And then I realized, okay, I love managing businesses more than, you know, uh, doing technical work. Okay. So I can say I'm more interested in the, you know, the opportunities that technology can bring, not in the technology itself. Okay. So this love is it. how I usually put myself, you know, introduce myself. Love it. That, yeah, no, amazing way. We're using technology as a tool, not as the the be all end all kind of thing. Love it. Love it. And before we dive into everything there, um, this is our first in person podcast. Like I mentioned, uh, where are we today and awesome. why are we here? <laughs> so, as your t shirt says, I mean, not mine, uh, we are here at the DMZ. This is the DMZ studio that we created to. To shoot some videos but what's the dmz is dmz is uh one of the top incubators in the world you know, top university based incubator in the world and uh what we do is just you know to find companies like you you know talented people you know young companies and startups like you and help them grow and you know realize their dreams and you know bring their dreams to reality so we provide them with almost anything they might need from training to funding to network to even you know a space to sit and work together so we are at the dmz right now and um i used to be actually one of the program leads of the dmz since yesterday i transitioned to a manager role so oh I'm congratulations <laughs> so i'm announcing it publicly right now <laughs> so i'm a manager of programs at the dmz right now okay and i guess i, I was going to dive into like what it's been like working as the program lead. So I'd be curious to talk about that, but also what does that new role mean uh, of what you're doing? So, I mean, I, I have no idea about my new role. So, I, you know, it just happens so quickly. And I realized yesterday that I'm transitioning to the manager role. So I prefer to keep, you know, my previous position for now for this podcast, okay. program lead. Day-to-day -day job, oh my God, amazing. I, I think the brightest uh, point of my day-to-day -day job is I'm not trying to be nice, not sugarcoating, but seriously working with, you know, amazing, talented and intelligent people like you as companies. 
And yeah, you know, our day-to-day -day job is just to have recurring meeting with our companies, make sure they have everything they need, you know, at the tip of their fingers. So uh, it, it, that's, you know, what we do in a nutshell, you know, program leads. But of course we do, you know, other things like, you know, designing the program, what, com what, what our startups companies need to learn or need to work on. So make sure, you know, they're aware of their situation and they have everything they need to address those situations. So this is, you know, a typical day of a program lead here at the DMC. <laughs> Amazing, yeah, and I can attest to that. You're really, as we've been going through the DMC program, everything that we've needed, you've been the person that has got it for us. I'm uh, glad, I'm glad to, seriously. I mean, something that makes this position, you know, working at the DMC super interesting to me is, uh, is that you can see the outcome of you know the decisions not mm -hmm. necessarily your decision but that's you know exactly the good part of it because you don't need to spend your time or you know <laughs> your money on the decisions you work with a bunch of you know amazing people that they you you can see you know the, the the evolution of their decision making process so you see that you know what decisions they make and what what's the outcome of those decisions so I learn a lot without spending my time or money on, you know, on learning. So that's amazing. I mean, right, I really right. like that. Love it, love it. Well, like, I want to dive in a little bit more on the DMZ later, but to, to take, a, take a step back, going through your LinkedIn and from our previous conversations, you had two CTO positions. Uh, you also had a CEO position that I want to talk about. Um, but at uh, IR PowerWeb and at Mega, you were a CTO. So... Um, Give, give us some more background on both sure. of those companies and what you're doing there. So, I mean, I, I will start with IR Power. IR Power is the, one of the biggest, you know, web hosting providers in Iran. And I started like, I don't remember, more than 10 years ago or 10 years ago. And I remember I went to, you know, the interview. Of course, I was looking for a job. I was a fresh graduate from high school. I was looking for a job. And as I told you, I was always, you know, mesmerized by technology, you know, working with servers, all different stuff. But I went to interview, I, I knew nothing about, you know, about servers, this kind of stuff. So, but I mean, the self-confidence worked. I mean, uh, maybe that, that was fake self-confidence or whatever. I, I, I took the job and, you know, I learned during, you know, d doing the job, doing the mm -hmm. actual job. So I would say, you know, I, I always had that entrepreneurial kind of hard in my chest so you know I, I took the job and yeah uh, I started as a uh, technical support representative just replying to tickets mm. and I remember I was you know I, I was replying to let's say like 100 tickets a day support tickets for web you know just managing servers you know just using you know, taking backups from you know people's server this kind of stuff and the second best person was doing like 20 tickets uh, a day, so five times more. So, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So I, yeah, I got promoted to, you know, to CTO and, you know, leading all the technical aspects. It took me like two or three years. Again, I don't remember. It wasn't that quick, but mm -hmm. yeah, I can say every job I applied for, it was like that, you know, I, I had no clue about the job. I applied, I went, you know, through it and I learned during, you know, during my time at that company. It was about that uh, IR power and about the other company, Mega. Mega is, uh, I'm not sure currently if this is, you know, the situation at this point or not, but they used to be the largest, you know, e-commerce back in Iran in, you know, that time, mm -hmm. even, you know, uh, the amount of transact, because we used to sell cars and cars, of course, are expensive. And we were the, you know, the only, let's say, legit car dealer, online car dealer in the country. Mm. So huge transaction, old company, all the codes, all the tools, all the software works, you know, were spaghettis. So no one could make any sense of, you know, what are these codes doing? I remember it was just, you know, like pure ASP.NET, even no MVC or any kind of OOP or anything, just, just pure code, just pure <laughs> ASP.NET, which I, I used to hate that time. And I learned, okay, I shouldn't care about the, you know, again, the language. So yeah, they hired me first as a kind of reformist kind of uh, consultant or something mm. to help them to, you know, adopt more, let's say, 
entrepreneurial mindset because that time I had my own startup and it was growing so fast. So uh, I remember through a connection, I got introduced to the CEO and CEO told me that we're looking for someone who can, you know, change the vibe of the company because it's a kind of old corporation style. And yeah, I've been there for a few months changing all this, even, you know, the, you know, the layout of the desk, everything. So they used to sit to the wall, so I changed everything. Okay. And <laughs> then I got promoted to CTO and my role there, to be honest, I'm confessing here, was just to bring on m m smart people, not, you know, doing the technical work mm -hmm. because it was way above my capa you know, capabilities. Right, right. The, the scope of the work. So I hired a bunch of good developers and yeah that's it that was it amazing i know that's that's what a good cto needs to do you can't you can't be doing all the technical development when you have a company like that and, and yeah. i had to pretend like i know everything right that was, that was the hardest part yeah <laughs> <laughs> and i i think it's making sense in my mind how you transition from there you were mentioning your startup i'm assuming that's to to nate or yeah. in pronounce farsi, donate yeah maybe. you can pronounce it as donate okay but it's written as two and a T. Right, right. Okay, amazing. And so that was at the same time as Mega that you were yes. doing? That? I launched my first, not first startup, because I used to have more online businesses before that, but Donate uh, was the first actual startup because everyone else, you know, start to call it, okay, this is a startup. It was the time that, you know, the second wave of entrepreneurship, you know, came to Iran and, you know, before the first generation, which right now they're the largest e-commerce platform in the country or whatever, we were the second wave. So that was the point I realized, okay, people called it a startup. That's, mm -hmm. you know, it was like 10 years ago when, you know, when I realized, okay, this is a startup, this is an entrepreneurship. And yeah, it was, uh, it was a crowdfunding platform and the intention was to uh, to build something like Kickstarter, and the reason was that I used to do lots of you know uh, hobby. I would say it's not work hobby, but like you know translating WordPress and put it out there for people just to download it for free. And then I, as I was growing, I came to realization: okay, I need to make money for myself. But you know this kind of open source project that I'm working is not making me any money. So let's build something, you know, for people like myself that can make money by doing creative stuff. So uh, I wanted to launch a Kickstarter for Iran because in Iran we couldn't use, we still can't use, you know, Kickstarter or any kind of international mm -hmm. uh, platform, let's say. And yeah, uh, we launched it in 2015 and, or 2014, I don't remember again. I have a bad memory. Anyway, it grew to become the largest crowdfunding platform of the region. And yeah, I was making good money. <laughs> and curious, like, uh, on that, like, why were you interested in working at Mega as kind of like that company that's more entrenched and older while also doing like a startup that's very new and like yeah. Kickstarter type Look, is very different. I'm going to be transparent with you. you. I mean, you know that, and I'm sure your audience will also feel that, but People look at entrepreneurs like, you know, they're wealthy people, they, you know, they set their own work schedule, you know, they have best work-life balance. It's not like that. It's, it's, it's not like that. It's, you know, it's like everything else except this one. I mean, so to be honest, it took us three years to learn to understand what we are doing at mm. So to be able to, you know, to pay my bills during these three years, I had to work somewhere else. Okay. So, which happens to be mega in that time. Yeah. So it was just to make enough money. Okay. It makes, it makes a lot of for sense. For the first, like, I would say three years, you weren't making that much money from today. Right, right. And I know a while back when we were in Montreal, you were talking about, like, opening schools in Iran. Yeah, Is, yeah. Was that part of Donate? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, the first idea for Donate was to be a Kickstarter kind of alternative for Iranian people, but it ended up being, being an Indiegogo alternative for Iranian people. So it was more on the charity side, I would say, mm -hmm. because of too many reasons, which is, you know, we don't want to discuss here. But yeah, we ended up being more, you know, on the charity side and collecting money from people, organizations mm -hmm. to, you know, to do charity projects, which include like, you know, we built like, around 10 or 12 schools. I mean, we didn't build, people, you know, 
contributed and we just collected the money and we signed the contract with let's say charities registered charities to go ahead and you know build the schools for us but yeah we, we built like you know 10 to 12 schools amazing amazing and and in building those schools uh were you involved with like any of the process of how those schools were built or I mean, designed or the first few ones i went there myself i mean physically i remember the first one that we built was in a in a village exactly on the border of iran and armenia so it was a long trip and for some part of it i remember we had to go with you know with animals you could you know no mm. car could get there so we we had to get there by you know animals so right. i went there myself and it was a you know amazing journey to be honest i'm not a spiritual guy but when you when you see the impact on other people's lives i mean it, it doesn't matter if you're a spiritual guy or not you know it, it will you know hit you right for sure yeah. for sure and yeah i guess like in like our podcast we're talking to a lot of educators in, in north america like curious uh, obviously there's a big impact in education anywhere but um, talking about that impact like what is the impact that you saw like what is the difference that that makes in opening a school there versus a new school in North America look uh, I mean I hope people take this you know with a grain of you know so I mean I'm trying to be frank here so education here when we're talking about education you know or where we are talking, you know, about our concerns about education. It's mostly, you know, let's say, let, let's put it this way. Some of the, you know, the hot topics these days is, you know, for example, equity or inclusion or diversity. So it shows the, you know, where we are at here, in, you know, in North America, the concern. So all the, you know, underlying layers, I would say, are already solved. Mm -hmm. So everyone, every, every child, I would say not, of course, not everyone, but... 99 percent i don't have the statistics uh but 99 percent of you know north american children have access to education and so but in many parts of the world which in iran is not the worst you know iran is just i would say iran is in, in, in the best you know places in the world in terms of education but it's still in those countries when you see okay people are left behind in terms of education it's not about, you know, equity. It's about the rights of living. I, I know how to put it, it's so hard. I mean, for example, let me give you an example. We, we talked a lot about, you know, my self-confidence in you know, speaking English. Let me put it this way. So when you're coming from a country that, you know, English speaking and training is banned as a kind of education, mm. it's not just about, you know, having better opportunities. It's about, you know, being able to survive in this world. So this is the, you know, this is the impact that you can have, you know, in people's life. When you, when you give people the most basic means of education, which is a classroom, you're not just giving them, you know, a tool or something to, to, you know, for their personal development. You're changing their lives entirely because the second best option for them, unfortunately, was to go and, you know, for girls, go and marry like when they're 14 years old mm. and for boys is just go and work on the farm or something like that so i mean again i'm not a spiritual person but i remember a moment that you know a photo that people you know one of those schools sent to me that they were like they all holding a paper all the students and all on those papers saying like you know thank you donate and you know when you look at those people and say okay this girl is like 15 years old right now and she could be in in a kind of in a worse situation kind of like waiting for a guy to come and you know pick her and go and you know bring a child to ward or i mean i don't want to talk about it but mm -hmm. you know what i mean it's the impact of you know education on people's life it's way different from north america and iran so i cannot put it into words makes sense though no it opens up so many options that yeah you only have one option before and now you have unlimited options of exactly. where you could go yeah. amazing amazing um and i guess uh, to transition back to to the dmz i'm i'm curious personally like coming from being a cto being the ceo of donate and that impact why did you want to to work at the dmz or come here and what is the the impact that you're you're seeing now <laughs> 
I mean, again, coming back, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about my own story. Mm-hmm. So I used to be, again, one of the IR power ways. Uh, I, I think I was around like 21, 22. I just came back from my military service, two years of military service. I was living my own good life in a small city, relatively small city in Iran, Shiraz. And, and I was doing my job. And I had no prospects to the future. I was just like a 20 year old guy doing day to day job and, you know, spending money on, you know, his girlfriend or this kind of stuff. And I felt like, okay, I want to build something for my, myself. Entrepreneurship comes into play. So I created Donate and I received an email from one of, no, I can say one of my friends who used to be that time manager of the first accelerator back in Iran. And invited me to their first, very first cohort. So I'm, I'm graduate of the first cohort of first accelerator in New York. And when I went there, I moved to Tehran, the capital of Iran. When I went there for six months, it's supposed to be like six weeks, and I ended up living in Tehran for six years. And I could really see the, you know, the firsthand impact of entrepreneurship on my own life. You know, mm. coming from a small city. My biggest dream was to, okay, I really want to have a car for myself so I can, you know, pick up my girlfriend and, you know, go and have dinner together. And it changed my idea, changed my mindset, changed my vision, my, you know, how I see the world, entrepreneurship. And, you know, it gave me so many opportunities. Because I felt that myself, I really fell in love with helping people, you know, having the same feeling, the same experience. So this is, you know, and then after donators start to make money and I had nothing else to do, to be honest, I wanted to kind of uh, retire myself, of <laughs> course, but I was, it was so boring. I reached out to one of my friends who was manager of another incubator. I mean, that was a few years later, mm-hmm. another incubator in Iran. I said, okay, uh, I have nothing to do. I want to come here and come, you know, with you and work with the startups because I really enjoy it. And that was the beginning of my journey of working with incubators so I spent like two years mentoring you know young entrepreneurs back in Iran and then I moved to Canada and I I knew that you know I I'm gonna you know continue my journey in an incubator so I didn't apply for any job I reached out directly to Shane you know Shane and I said okay Shane I don't care if you don't pay me or anything I just want to work there and because I knew the impact and I still, if I look at, you know, my career, my vision going forward, it will be another incubator. I know it would be my own incubator. I know the specifics of it. But, you know, again, I think I found my career here. Amazing, amazing. And in that, like, it, as I said, we talked to a lot of teachers. And I think, like, being a mentor, being in an incubator, it's like being, being a teacher. Um, curious, like, from the experience that you have of like opening schools versus being like a mentor there like what do you think are some of the the challenges that you face that are like the same as teachers versus what are maybe some different challenges of being more of a uh not like an academic teacher but a teacher in a different way i never been a formal academic teacher i i love it seriously this is one of my kind of jobs if i if i were if i was not here probably I used to, you know, I would be a teacher. But talking about, you know, the challenges of being a mentor. First, I don't see myself as a mentor, at least here, because, you know. I do. Thank you, I appreciate it. But I would say the, the biggest challenge is that you're working with the smart people. And it's so hard to work with the smart people. And those smart people, I mean, you guys, you know that you are smart. And not all of, you know, the smart people are kind of welcoming feedback. Mm -hmm. So when you're trying to give a feedback to a smart person, you should be super cautious how you put it into words. I mean, so I learned that, you know, back in Iran again, I used to dictate my advices to, you know, companies I used to work work with. But right now, learn that okay, it's not gonna work anymore here because the scale of the companies, the you know, the level of the companies are higher. You know, founders are more mature, so they don't really take the feedback easily because they believe they know and they really know. So you know, something I told you, you know, something I really enjoy 
working with teams is that I, I can learn. But the biggest challenge I faced is just how to communicate your message so it's taken by you know the, the other party, the other side of the table, and they don't see as, okay, Mohi is giving us advice, okay, Mohi, who you are yourself, or something like that. And so I, I think that's the most challenging part of it. And how would you say that you've overcome that or are trying to overcome that today? It's, like to... That's the point. It's different <laughs> from company, from individual to individual. Right, from okay. From person to person. So I think the safest option is always to ask questions, you know. So one of my ideas for, you know, for my new role as a manager here is that, you know, I have to supervise the, you know, the communication, the relationship between our startups and program leads is that one of the changes I'm going to propose to my team, you know, probably today is that spend the first two, three hours with the companies, just make sure you know them, not only the company, the founders, you know, their personal and professional challenges and concerns to the stage that you will be able to pitch their business on behalf of them mm. as clear and as concise as the founders. So making sure because, you know, people do like give advice. This is the reality. I like to I like to give advice because it gives me a good feeling that uh, I know something. But people don't like to hear advice. This is you know that that that's a challenge. You know if so, first spend few hours, make sure you know everything about the company, about the business, about the individual, and then go and reflect with yourself. Think how they can really you know do something better, and then how you can communicate that message. It might take time. But I think that's the that's the way that you know we as a, okay. Thank you for naming me a mentor. But mentors should do mm -hmm. just making sure they understand the context and they put it in the best way possible to you know to communicate their message. Oh, I, I love that advice because I know uh, mentors that we've worked with. Uh, some of them, like uh, DMZ mentors, have been amazing. But some mentors that we've worked with in the past will be talking for three four months and they're giving us advice and then they'll like throw some crazy idea of like oh virtual reality could do like x y or z that's like completely different from what we do and it's like do you even understand <laughs> what, what, what we're talking about so something and, else i mean uh if i want to add quickly here is that you know i really believe that and i think it's one of you know my the things that i always have in my mind is that people regardless of their positions regardless of their you know social you know situation or whatever they're people they're human so in order to be able to impact on a person you need first to make that connection on the human level mm -hmm. and then everything comes you know on the top so if i can you know make you trust in me if i can trust in you myself if we don't have that binding as a friend there is no way i can you know i can give you an advice that and you can take it and you will take it so this is, I think, my approach. Always, not not only here as a mentor. Whenever I go, if I go to change my tires or anything, if I wanna, if I have a request, if I want a discount or whatever, I just try to make to find something in common between that person, make a friendship, and then once we have that friendship, I will build everything on the top of it. I love that, and like uh, I think just like you said, it works in every context, but. Obviously, our podcast focuses around academics a lot, so like I think that's a, a very good point where you you look at those lecture halls that have 100, 500 students, and you, you can't make that connection. So if you have those those smaller groups of maybe 20, 30 people at most, um, making that connection over those first few weeks, uh, I think is very important. I uh, love that. Love that. Um, I guess in, in your experience, uh, I know I know you've been looking into to AI a bunch. Obviously, we've talked about virtual reality a lot in the past. Like, how do you think these new technologies that are like coming out can help overcome some of those challenges? I, got <laughs> I mean, I, I I don't know if you can see it, but I got goosebumps. <laughs> about AI and VR, I think AI is. I mean, that's a new world. I I want to talk it definitely about VR. I think what VR is doing is. Aside from all the, you know, benefits that we all know, you know, that you can, you will learn better, you know, with images, with photos, with videos, you know, I mean, what's your, you know, slogan? I think 
help a million people learn from no, actions and not actions, statements. Not a statement. yeah. Aside from that, which is 100% true, I think accessibility. I told you, we had to use animals to get to a village and build a school there with kind of brick and mortar and all, I mean, all the school stuff. And even here, 21st century North America, Toronto, one of the most advanced, you know, cities in the world, we are still building schools, which doesn't make sense to me. And huge schools with lots of, you know, parking space, you know, playground. I love the playground. <laughs> here, but it doesn't make sense to me. So I think what we are is going to do is to change this, you know, this mindset that people don't need to be physically present to really learn. And I think this is about VR and, you know, accessibility point of it. I mean, mm. side of it is, is revolutionary, I would say. But about AI, which, you know, in combination with VR could be, oh, my God, but I'm going to, you know, talk about them individually. Yes. Yeah. AI, I think it's, we had a kind of conversation with another manager at the DMZ, and I wrote an email. So I'm, I'm confessing, and I don't have any problem with admitting that, you know, since like three months ago, almost 60, 70 percent of all my emails communications, you know, is using chat GP. <laughs> Why not? And people think that, okay, they're, they're you know, cutting me if, okay, was your email written by ChatGPT? Of course it was. Why not? I mean, so the reason, my reason behind, you know, the rationale behind is that, you know, for whatever reason, which I don't want to enter, I don't have, you know, knowledge or anything to enter that topic, but for whatever reason, English speakers, native English speakers had a privilege were enjoying a benefit of, you know, having their own language as a, you know, international language all around mm -hmm. the world. So for a person like me who born in Iran, grew up as an Iranian guy in a country that, again, you know, English training is kind of banned, at least in schools, I had to either pay a lot of money to go to a, you know, kind of uh, to a classroom to learn English aside from my school and spend time and, okay, my family didn't have enough money to, you know, spend time sending me to learn English so whatever I learned was with computers and whatever so I'm coming from that background but I really believe I have good ideas but I, I cannot really express them easily so I think what AI is doing something like ChatGPT is doing is to bring equity to 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 not to you know to all areas so right now linguistics doesn't matter anymore ideas man mm -hmm. and i think it's a fair ground for everyone to to shine to show themselves before before this revolution even if i was the brightest person in the world but if i couldn't talk in english i had problems right now i think it's not a problem hopefully going forward it would be even easier so i can talk in my own you know language my mother's language and it will be translated so i think this gives me everyone in the world a, a fair ground that guys it's just about ideas and it's not about linguistics we don't need to spend years learning different languages just because you know i burned that part of the world and someone else burned you know another part of the world so i think this is i would call it accessibility again combination of it with vr and oh my god i mean I can be anywhere in the world. I can sit in front of you. I can talk in my own language. You will hear me in my, you know, your own language. So, I mean, I, I would say the world will become borderless, really borderless mm -hmm. for the first time in history. I, I love that on th three different points that I'll throw out. Like uh, this morning, I started listening to the Hitchhiker, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Mm -hmm. um, and they talk about like a fish that you put in your ear that allows you to like speak any language or hear any language and everything. I'm like, that's what AI could do there on that borderless side of things. I think VR, other like uh, technology based learning, just like you're saying, like um, allows that accessibility. And I, a perfect example is this past Friday, I was at Conestoga College and they have a, they have a VR program and uh, they were doing all of their like capstone demonstrations of the video games they built. And there was a student there, uh, I think he was from India, but I can't remember for sure. Uh, Guru was his name. Um, and he has done VR projects for Airbus and for like all these large companies, but 
he did them in India. And so he's coming here and because that's where he got his education and that's where he like got those, those skills, he's now taking a course that's just like a one year course. And it's like, if you have the same access to education around the world, it's like exactly. you have those skills. There's no need technically to have to take that course. And it's, it's, it's to benefit of everyone, you know, every single person on this planet. Yes. It's, you know, if we have a more educated, let's say world population, it would benefit everyone. Everyone can work together. Like it's, yeah. Yes. yeah. Lots of talents, you know, again, it's, you know, we are talking about education, but there are lots of talents that because lack of education, they cannot flourish and they cannot show themselves. I think, you know, I'm, I'm sad for them, but more, more than I'm sad for ourselves because I'm the one who's used, you know, losing the opportunities. I mean, I'm the one losing the opportunity of, you know, investing as a, I don't know, as an investor, for investing in a company which was built by one of those folks, those, those intelligent people. Oh. Or even that aside, like it's one of those people may be able to discover the cure to cancer or exactly. like or renewable electricity or whatever. Yeah, a lot of them in the history. We've mm -hmm. seen a lot of people who coming from underprivileged background and coming to you know, you know Pfizer. Pfizer is an example of it. You know the the founder of the company Pfizer is a you know Turkish immigrant, if I'm not mistaken, or Armenian immigrant. Sorry, don't you know if I'm making a mistake. But he was an immigrant. But there are a lot of, okay, he was lucky. I was lucky because I could move to Canada. It, it you know, I had to save money for years. Mm -hmm. I had to save, my parents had to save money for years. But we are the lucky ones still. We could get in here. But what about the rest of people who, who can't? Yes. So that's the point. That's, I mean, that's why I love these guys <laughs> here. <laughs> love it, love it. And I guess to, to dive into like the AI side a little bit more, I'm, curious on your opinions i feel like i know what your answers are going to be but curious around your opinions there's there's schools right now in canada the u.s around the world that some of them they're they're banning uh ai use in chat gpt and writing essays and everything or any use cases there's other schools i believe U of T just mm -hmm. like started a program where they're teaching students how to use chat gpt mm -hmm. so like what do you think about the the huge difference between some schools completely banning it, some schools teaching it, and uh, yeah. I mean, first you cannot stop it. You cannot you cannot stop you know advancement of technology. There is no way. No one could do that. You know, in the history, you cannot find. You can just you know put delay in the into works, but you cannot stop it. So this is I mean, good try for that university that I don't even remember their name. You just said but U of T. Was, <laughs> no, U of T was the one who's. Oh, who's doing it? Yeah, yeah, who's doing it? There's a ton of ones that are banning yeah, it. Yeah. Sure. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, good try. You're wasting your money. You're wasting your time, and you're making a bad brand of yourself. Just this is my message to you. But I mean, uh, yes, you know, my idea is that if you want to force the students, young people, to memorize. I don't know if I can use this word or not, but I'm going to use it. You can just put a beep on that. But <laughs> if you want force them to, you know, to memorize bullshit, you have to ban chat GPT. If you want people, your students to, to have critical thinking, you need to teach them how to use chat GPT. So, I mean, yeah, with our current education system that most of the time you're forcing them just to memorize lots of nonsense, which they don't use in their life. I'm a I mean, we've we all been, you know, trained, we all undergone, like, you know, education for 14 years, 13 years, something like that. And I think I, I have only worse of one year of, you know, beneficial education in my life. Mm. And not, the rest was just, you know, waste of my time, waste of my, you know, my age, my, my energy. So this is my idea. If people want to kind of, if we want to bring up, you know, people who can think critically and do be creative we need to teach them how to use you know how to walk or how to grow with technology otherwise you're just you know just it's like calculator used to be banned i remember even me remember that calculator used to be banned but right now everyone's using calculator even in, in a school you're allowed to use calculator yeah yeah i remember back in school back in high school or grade school like uh 
yeah, calculators, they were banned on tests. You could use them beforehand. And every teacher would always say, like, you're never going to have a calculator, like, always on you. And like, yeah, well, we do nowadays. <laughs> and but same with AI. You know, I mean, something I heard, not recently, but it was so interesting that the advancement of technology is so fast right now that you cannot really forecast what our young people, what the students, I mean, I'm a young people, why do I talk like that? But what our students would need in their future. So instead of teaching them something to memorize again, something to put in their mind and never use it again, teach them how to be creative and how to address and face challenges of life. Because what you're trying to teach them right now, probably, most probably, would be useless in a few years from now. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why, I mean, I don't get it, why people are still, you know, insisting on doing that, why it's so obvious. You know, it's 2023. <laughs> exactly. The things that we learned, like, two years ago, I was, I was a, you know, uh, a college student, like, two years ago. And half of the things that I learned there, here even in North American college, you know, and education system, are now useless, are deprecated. I don't need them anymore. Mm -hmm. But this is the reality. Love it. And I, I think... If, if you're okay talking about it, I don't know if you are, I know you have an AI idea that you're working on. Are you okay to talk about it? Yeah. I, I'm curious, like, with that, um, a, I think is allowing students or kids to, to learn creatively and, and use AI in a very creative way. So I'd be curious to, to talk about that as much as you want to, or if you don't, we can cut this out. <laughs> no, no, I'm okay to talk about it, but because I'm not the first one, you know, every day I can see a kind of a new, same idea, someone builds the same idea and they're, you know, putting it out there for people to use. It's not directly relevant to education, but, so one of the ideas is that I had an idea, I had a kind of, I have a nephew, she's like four or five years old, and uh, I remember, you know, my brother, used to tell her a story every night and it was kind of overwhelming for my brother. So I tried, okay, I said that time, like two years ago, I want to build a business that tells a story for children. And I run it actually, I, I created it actually. And I used some writers to write the pieces of the stories for us. And then we could customize each story, you know, based on the children. But the problem was that it wasn't scalable and it was so expensive. Which story could cost us like five dollars to generate so we had to sell it for ten dollars and no one would pay ten dollars for a story but right now with ai with this generative ai the cost of you know generating a story a per, even more personalized story dropped to like a few cents so i thought okay that's a good idea just to run this business once again and try it with the new structure cheaper more scalable so we are building the product. We already have paying customer pre-product, uh, and we are just you know using Chat GPT interface to generate the stories. I think it will help people, help you know, children with their creativity, and it's about you know teaching them the life skills. So you know what we all know is that you know people, children, tend to listen to their friends more than their parents. So if, if there is a story that, you know, unintentionally or undercover is teaching you something and it's coming from your friend or it's, it's from a cartoon, let's say, character, like, for example, I'm a chill, I'm, I'm in love with Mickey Mouse and Mickey Mouse tells me, okay, you need to wash, you know, brush your teeth every night. So I think this is the, the, one of the projects I'm working on and a few other projects that, you know, it's AI, but they're completely far from education. Space. Okay. Yeah. No, no. I, yeah. I think the, the creative side of things and teaching kids those lessons, like those are the building blocks that you need to, as at that age to, to go into the education system and hopefully the education system keeps improving. Um, and, and I know uh, someone else we had on the podcast, Michael Avis, um, he was talking about um, like a future AI that, that grows with you as you go through education. So if it starts as your storybooks that uh, from the and age of like two to the five. Stories will grow with the children. Exactly. Four years old that you know their parents have to read the stories for them up to fifteen years old when they're we should start talking about 
sexual, you know, trainings, this kind of stuff. So mm. this is the idea to have to cover all this, you know, range. I would say. I love it. I love it. And like how AI is evolving, I can see how like ChatGPT, ChatGPT just added uh, plugins. So I could yeah. see how that could be like a plugin of like that's the storytelling, but then that's feeding in that there's an AI that's at school with them and that AI is learning about the science and math topics that they're learning and helping them learn that. Yeah, no, I, I love it, I love it. Um, to take take a, actually we're, we're running low on time, I don't know how much time you have and I think we're, we're over time. So uh, I'll jump into, we do this thing with kind of like rapid fire questions where okay. I'll just say like one or one or two words and then you say your opinion on them if you don't have an opinion or uh, Okay, no worries, we can skip it. Sorry, yeah, one word. What is the like thought or opinion oh that comes God. to mind? <laughs> okay, I, I cannot promise to stick to one word, but okay, yeah, yeah, one sentence, I guess, at uh, most. Um, first one, pop culture. Hmm, K-pop. I don't just randomly the first word comes <laughs> to my mind. K-pop. Uh, not so good values. Gen Z. <laughs> kind of stuff. Okay. Okay. No. <laughs> I look like an old guy. <laughs> no, no, it's great. Uh, conference or event. Most of the time, time waster, but good for networking. I personally love it. Okay, love it. Love it. Uh, Unity or Unreal? <laughs> oh, it reminds me the game Unreal, Unreal Tournament, if you remember that, you know, I, that was the only game I used to play in my life, Unreal Tournament, but I would say creativity, amazing graphics, quality, and yeah, this kind of stuff, games okay. in, in general. Okay, amazing, amazing. Um, educational NFTs. Oh my god, two, I mean... Education in terms of the, the you know the the, the, uh, the old school model of education, two words that I cannot make sense of. Okay. <laughs> NFTs and education. Both, I, mean. I can see that. I can see that. I'd love to talk to you more about it though. But um, the metaverse. Potential, but no application at the moment. Agreed. Agreed. Um, education. Necessity. Game changer. Okay. Uh, favorite book? Alchemist Paulo Coelho. Okay. Favorite movie? A lot, but the first one comes on is uh, High. I don't remember if the name was High, but there was a guy walking on high lines between two buildings. Uh, it it based on a true story yeah, with, with uh, story. Um, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Yeah, I think. I yeah. Think. yeah. Then yeah. It was high or something like that, but yeah. Yeah, it's about so the. Okay, I don't think I've seen that one, but I've, I've seen the trailer and everything, so yeah. I'll have to check it out. Awesome. Uh, and last one, um, don't know how how much you're following XR blockchain news, but in this week, this month, what's like the top thing in in that news, I, or I guess as well AI that's like you've been seeing in the news and you're interested in? I'm just, I'm scared and I'm waiting for GPT-5, so it's not the news, I'm looking for news in the future, mm. but the recent news, I mean, it's so interesting, the fight between these big players in the game, like, you know, Elon Musk, you know, OpenAI, Sam Altman, it's not the news, it's something happening and unfolding, so I'm I'm trying to stay, you know, aware of everything. It's fun to watch, isn't it? Yeah, it's <laughs> fun to watch, and also it would impact our lives as well. That's why I watch. For sure, for sure. All right, amazing. Um, two two final questions that we like to ask. Number one, is there anyone when I ask who should be on the podcast next that comes to mind that we should be reaching out to? There are a lot. I'm thinking. <laughs> Can I add? Uh, you know, answer that later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are a lot of people, but I'm thinking who would be you know interesting person because after me you definitely need an inter interesting person to come no this was Watch it out. no this was an amazing conversation so but yeah would love to hear any suggestions you have later um and yeah just ending it off is there any obviously we talked about a lot of current projects you're working on in ai working at the dmz is there any project or anything that you would like to to plug or for people to check out it's i mean i wish i was prepared for this question, to be honest, because I think that's an opportunity that I'm missing right now. But I think 
exploring the AI and starting with ChatGPT and what else you can do with ChatGPT. Just quickly, I want to tell it. You know, the, the idea that I told you, um, the idea that I'm working on. I used to be a developer a few years ago. I cannot code anymore because I, I don't remember the syntax and everything. Mm -hmm. So just to give people an idea, you know, how mesmerizing this chat GPT and, you know, generative could be, I was like, you know, right now you just need to envision your idea. You just need to have an idea. So this is a story. I started to run, you know, to open a notepad file or whatever, sublime or whatever, to write a code. And then I realized, okay, I'm too old for writing code. But I have the idea. So I went to ChatGPT and asked ChatGPT, give me a code that connects to yourself, I mean, to ChatGPT, and does that. So I created the first version of the product in less than 24 hours without even one single line of coding. And ChatGPT gave me a code that connects to itself via API and does something, you know, in my opinion, extraordinary. So exploring the ChatGPT and how it can, you know, improve efficiency in everyone individual's job and day-to-day -day life i think i'm having a better life after chat gpt seriously and so i would encourage people to do the same and just really take time in their own no distraction and figure out how they can use this chat GPT because that's future and that's growing super fast and the last thing we people want is just to you know stay behind in the care so i mean it wasn't the best, but the best I could. No, that's amazing advice, I think, for, for anybody and just continuing to share uh, things that benefit other people. Obviously, we'll also make sure that in the show notes, we link to the DMZ for any entrepreneurs that are interested. Uh, and if, if you would like to, to link to, to your AI book company, uh, would ha happily put that in there as well so people can check it out and hopefully become customers. Um, but Mohi, thank you so much for, for being on the podcast. Uh, everyone, if, if you're still listening to the podcast, if you made it to the deep end here with us, um, comment, uh, Mohi's awesome and we'll uh, buy you and we'll pick one person to buy you a VR game. <laughs> so. You don't have to, but thank you for having me. And yeah, it was a pleasure. And thank you. Thank you. Awesome.